Today my topic is somewhat different. Um, we face a peculiar contradiction in the modern world where the gifts of uh, modern science have delivered more to humanity than might ever have been anticipated by previous generations. And yet at the same time we face a rising anti-science sentiment in several of our most important uh, public health and agriculture and other areas. And I'm puzzled to try to examine why this is. Um, and I do so with a certain humility, given my own role in the GMO issue, and also my own experience in some of these other areas, most importantly in, on climate change. Now, I left university in 1995 with a degree in politics and modern history. I didn't study science after the age of 16, and my level of numeracy is fairly low. So <laughs> I got involved in the GMO issue as an environmental campaigner. And my first inkling that this was a, an area of interest came when I attended a workshop by a representative of Greenpeace in, um, in a chilly squat in the coastal city of Brighton in 1996. And that was the first time I heard the word Monsanto. It was the first time I heard the words GM or GMO. First time I heard the words Soya, Roundup Ready, and some of these other things which have become so identified with, uh, with, with this debate. And as I talk about in the book, I was one of the first people, certainly in the UK, to write about this issue and to encourage um, my fellow environmentalists to get involved with campaigning against it. Because at that time, we saw genetic modification as nothing less than an existential threat to the British countryside. We saw it as an extension of chemical companies' uh, monopolies and push towards monocultures. Uh, we saw it as a potential threat, not just to the environment, but to people's health. And we saw it as an extension of everything which we believed was wrong with uh, modern day global agriculture. Now I haven't turned around on all of those issues. Um, my concerns about the GMO issue and science relate to just some of those things and we can talk about that um, later on in the Q&A. But my own involvement was, as you've heard in the introduction, to actually go out and wreck these uh, crops by night and by day um, because we wanted to use direct action to eliminate them completely. And the government actually at the time made that very useful because they published six-figure grid references for all the GMO test sites that were being conducted at the time. So we simply, a few of us simply maintained a spreadsheet and ticked them off one by one as uh, the field wreckers went out there and uh, trashed the trials. And as I said, this, I've said before, this was probably the most successful campaign I was ever involved in. By about 1999, there were no GM test sites left in the UK at all. And the general public had come to believe that this was a, 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 almost a demonic technology. It had been a, associated with this tag Frankenfoods. Uh, all the popular press were against it. Prince Charles said that GM took uh, mankind into a realm which should be re reserved for God alone. And the anti-GMO hysteria, as, it, as I would later look at it, had spread around the world. Um, and the shockwaves from that are still reverberating today. Now, I'll fast forward the story somewhat to the year 2008, which is when I first began to have some doubts about uh, my own previous views on this issue. And what happened was I had kind of discovered science in writing about um, climate change. So I actually visited uh, Australia in 2002 um, when I was researching material for my first book, High Tide. And that involved, I went to Heron Island, if anyone's been there, on the, on the Great Barrier Reef. Um, and I went to islands in the Pacific, which are being swamped by sea level rise. And one of the centerpieces from that book was a photograph of a glacier in the Peruvian Andes, which, uh, well, I compared the one which I took when I went back there in 2002 with the one that my father took when he was working there as a geologist in 1980. And this whole glacier had just disappeared within a single generation of my own family. 
Um, th those, those pictures actually made it into Al Gore's film, Inconvenient, An Inconvenient Truth. And so, you know, I realized at the time, I knew at the time, in fact, that this was, that I had to do better than just present an anecdotal picture of what, what, what you might experience in terms of global warming impacts, and that I had to back that up with science, and that science had to be peer-reviewed, and it had to be uh, scientific evidence that was published in academic journals. And so I kind of had a, uh, an experience of my own sort of personal enlightenment, if you like, as a humanities graduate to, to discover the value of empiricism um, to, and to begin to understand myself what science meant and why scientific objectivity is, is such a valuable thing and so important for, for us uh, in terms of the decisions we have to make in society. And in 2007, I published a book, Six Degrees, which did a degree-by-degree degree picture of how global temperature rise would affect our planet and affect humanity in the decades to come. I'm about to, to start work on, a, on an update of that, which should be out in 2020. And a lot of what was in Chapter 1 has already begun to happen, although it's begun to happen earlier than um, even I expected at the time. Uh, Great Barrier Reef has uh, already suffered... Uh, severe bleaching episodes, as I'm sure you're all aware, um, and this has happened earlier, and it's happened more rapidly than even we feared back in um, back a few uh, a decade or so ago. And in 2008, I actually got the Royal Society Science Books Prize for six degrees, and I was very um, I was delighted about that because I was really keen to try to make clear to people that I was working with the best science that was available, and to have that from the Royal Society, which is the you know, the, the most prestigious scientific institution in, in the UK. In fact, I think it's the oldest scientific um, association anywhere in the world. Um, so that meant a lot to me. But just three days after that time, I received a phone call from the editors of The Guardian, of the op-ed desk, asking whether I would write a quick anti-GMO piece. Uh, I tell this story in the book if you want the full blow-by-blow full -blow account, um, which I duly did. And I think the headline was, GM won't be a harvest for the world. And so I would kind of re rehashed all my old talking points from my anti-GMO days. And it wasn't until I read the comments under, underneath that, where people pointed out that I had no science underlying what I was saying, that that really be began, that was the first time it hit home to me that I might have got this uh, issue wrong. And that led eventually, one thing led to another. And in 2013, I made a speech at the Oxford Farming Conference apologizing for my earlier anti-GMO campaigning. Um, apologizing in particular to that audience, which was an audience of farmers, uh, one or two of whom actually claimed that I'd personally destroyed their crops, uh, you know, 15 years earlier. Um, so that was a, meaning, a meaningful apology, and I got a lot of unexpected attention for that, and that's led to a, a kind of a five-year detour in my career where I've focused um, to, on GMOs almost to the exclusion of all else. Uh, well, I don't intend to do that forever, but um, it was an area where I felt like I could make a difference because I could speak from personal experience about why it is um, that um, much of the world and certainly the environmental movement has got this issue back to front. And I also felt it was incumbent on me to try and right some of the wrongs there because I now see this as an as a issue of social justice in many ways, particularly as it pertains to, to developing countries. Um, since 2013, I've been to numerous countries in Africa, I've been to Bangladesh, I've been to the Philippines, lots of places where traits, genet genetically modified crop traits could be extremely useful to farmers in some of these poorer countries, but they've been prevented from accessing them because of anti-GMOs, myths and misinformation which uh, still circulate and which I feel, to some extent, complicit in having started. Um, to give you one example, I was in uh, Tanzania a couple of years ago, and when I was interacting with, with farmers and journalists out there, um, one activist stood up and said that, uh, that GMO corn, GMO maize, had a gene in it which was going to turn African children homosexual, and that this was some kind of Western conspiracy to you know, to, to destroy Africa's population. And you'd be, you know, it sounds, it, it sounds absurd, and it is absurd, but you'd be surprised how potent these things are. And we were just talking about China. And in China, if you extrapolate out from the latest polling, probably 300 million people believe that uh, GMOs are a US conspiracy to uh, somehow undermine China to stop it achieving superpower status. 
Um, and in Africa, it's the same. You, so you have these kinds of um, social, political insecurities which are played on by ac activist movements in their, in their aims to, to undermine science. And these do have a, have a real effect on people's lives. So in, in Tanzania and in Uganda, Kenya as well, uh, many of the staple crops that, um, that the local smallholder farmers depend on are being affected by new pests and diseases. Um, to give you a couple of examples, uh, cassava is suffering from uh, vir virus attacks, this cassava brown streak virus, which is really decimating uh, crops across the whole region. Uh, there is a GMO solution in the offing, which uses a, a, a genetic sequence from the virus itself to confer resistance um, in the cassava. Um, but, as you might expect, it's been prevented from being made available to farmers because of the anti-GMO political climate. Um, when Uganda quite recently in December, the parliament finally, after many years of delay, passed a biosafety law to enable the scientists to actually take these crops outside the laboratory, um, the anti-GMO activists managed to, as far as I've heard, convince the president's wife that this was going to uh, give children diseases or some kind of uh, conspiracy theory along those lines. The president refused to sign the law, it's now gone back to parliament and we can look forward to many more months or even years of, 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 of stalemate and blocking where the uh, African scientists become more and more frustrated as the efforts that they make to try to improve the livelihoods of their own, their own farmers are, are blocked by anti-GMO campaign groups. And so that's the, the, the moral challenge that um, faces us in developing countries. In developed countries, I think the challenge is a broader one where where we need to, I mean everyone agrees on this, we need to feed a growing world population, we probably need to double the overall amount of food which is produced by 2050, and we need to do so in the context of addressing some of the more serious environmental challenges which farming clearly has. No one's saying that uh, agriculture as it's, as it's conducted nowadays is 100% is perfect and, uh, and still less that it's sustainable. So we need to reduce, continue to reduce agrochemical use, we need to work on fertilizers, pesticides, we need to work on water, we need to work on land use. All of these things will be very familiar to you. But on all of these things, genetic modification can be a tool for positive change. So um, to look at nitrogen, for example, we've got nitrogen efficient crops which are, should, are already becoming available. Um, water, again, back in Africa, drought tolerance is a trait which is being developed in maize. Um, I work with Cornell University at the Cornell Alliance for Science, funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and they're interested in developing drought-tolerant maize because that's something which would be useful to farmers in, in drought years. And, you know, here with climate change, the droughts are becoming more extensive, more frequent, and the people who are most at risk and most vulnerable to these droughts are, of course, those who are producing their own food, those who are in a subsistence situation where what they can produce in a single harvest is what their children have to eat. Um, and, and for them, the drought tolerance technology could be, the most, could be one of the most important things which is developed. And yet that too is, is being blocked by anti-GMO anti -GMO misinformation. So to circle back, where does this sit in terms of the wider context of, uh, of science communication? Um, I see the anti-GMO uh, misinformation as being part of the same phenomenon as global warming denialism, um, anti-vaccine uh, misinformation, and some of the other ways that you see at the moment in modern politics this sort of populist anti-elite uh, undercurrent becoming more and more resurgent and challenging the, uh, the centrality of expertise in science. So you have this peculiar situation where the more expert that people are about something, the less they are considered uh, able to make a decision on it. And if you think, if you were to apply that to medicine, do you ask your taxi driver to conduct open heart surgery? Or do you, I don't know, ask your local brewer to fly the aeroplane that brought me here? I mean, it doesn't make any sense in a personal, practical, everyday experience. And yet, that seems to be the political climate that we're moving into. And so I see that as, 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 as extremely, extremely problematic. And I challenge the environmental movement to come into accord with science in all of the most important areas that it works in. I don't see Greenpeace's anti-science on deforestation or climate change. 
Um, but I do see it as anti-science on uh, GMOs and on nuclear power, by the way, which is another issue I've looked at in the past. Um, and in fact, to, to circle back, that's my own story. That is why I changed my mind, was because I wanted to be consistent in terms of being pro-science across all of, the, all of the different areas. So in 2012, I think it was, the American Association for the Advancement of Science published a board statement on the safety of GMOs. And this, for me, really clarified the issue and forced me to come out in public because it used the same language as an earlier board statement on climate change. So the climate change statement said the science of, you know, climate, the science is clear. Climate change is real and is human cause. On GMOs, it said the science is clear. GMOs currently in the food supply are as safe as any other food. And so there it was in black and white. I couldn't call myself as a science communicator or even environmentalist uh, consistent if I was saying you must listen to the scientists on climate change, but you must ignore the scientists on GMOs. And yet that's the position that um, many of the environmental groups remain in and the sort of horns of the dilemma that they're still on to this very day. I do think, however, that there are signs of improvement. Um, it's gone very quiet from some of our biggest environmental groups on GMOs, and I think that's about as positive as it could be. In fact, I think Greenpeace is out of the game now in terms of anti-GMO campaigning, um, and that it's becoming more and more of a sort of extremist uh, perspective out there. Um, as I think, so I think science is, is able to win, um, but we need policymakers um, to to accept um, that science should be the guiding light in, in, in all of these areas. And I would say the same on climate change, which of course is a, a big issue um, here in uh, Australian politics at the moment. It's, it's extraordinary that you can have a former prime minister um, in a situation of, of, of denying obvious science on an issue as important as uh, global warming, which affects the whole future of humanity on this planet. And in some ways, it's, I often come across this as the flip side, that you've got kind of pro-GMO people who claim that science is on their side, and yet they disbelieve the science on climate change. And you've got pro-climate people who refuse to accept the science on GMOs. And I would say to both of them that they're inconsistent and that they're letting their politics and they're letting their ideology blind them to, to scientific evidence. And so for me, my sort of final pitch is to let the science do the talking on these areas, to respect empiricism and scientific objectivity. Um, politics still has a role. Politics is about our values and about where we want society to go. In no way is this saying that science should overtake politics, but we shouldn't allow science denialism to win the day, particularly when we've got such, uh, such important issues on the agenda. So with that, I will, I will wrap up and uh, let you uh, come to any questions or anything else you want to talk about. Thank you.